Here's Paul the Apostle nearing death, and he knows that he's nearing death. And when somebody comes to the end of their life, usually what they have to say is of great importance to them, if not to others as well. And so he's saying something very, very important here. Actually, he's saying this in verse 14, and this is really the title of the message this morning. Continue thou. It's so uh, joyful for us to come back after the, the, the amount of time we've been gone and see not only new people, praise the Lord for that, but uh, I'm not going to say old people. <laughs> Experienced people who have stayed by the stuff and have been faithful and have done what God wanted them to do. And, you know, you just want to st stand up and shout glory. Because uh, I think uh, Greg was saying this morning in the Sunday school class here, we all know people who started out and didn't continue. They quit somewhere along the line. They got hurt in church. They got embarrassed. Somebody said the wrong thing to them. Preacher didn't part his hair on the right side. I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> and uh, so they kind of quit on God. They don't come any, anymore. They don't do it anymore. And, and you, you, you want to say from the bottom of your heart, hey, Keep it up. Continue. Do what God called you to do. And so Paul is saying to his protege here, Timothy, uh, as for you, and this is the emphasis in this statement, as for you, underline the word, you continue doing what? The things you've learned to do and you've been assured of doing, that you're confident that God is pleased with. Keep doing those things. Don't quit doing that. Keep growing, but keep doing the things that you've been doing. Well, f first of all, you, you continue by um, starting. You don't continue doing anything until you've started doing it. And the beginning of your Christian life and mine is conversion, isn't it? Boy, the other, last few days I've heard some wonderful conversion stories. People who were in death row, uh, who trusted the Lord and were saved. And uh, so many different ways that people have come to know the Lord. And yet Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes except by me. So we know that everybody comes the same way by the Lord Jesus Christ. But aren't the circumstances wonderfully different? Some of you were saved in church in a revival meeting as I was. Uh, some of you were saved at a Christian camp. Many of our young people who went away to Christian camp, like the wilds in different places, found the Lord as their Savior there. And they began that uh, journey as a believer. You don't continue unless you first start. Where did you start? What was your starting point? I remember um, at, at age 15, I wanted to kill myself. Uh, I felt f nothing worth living for as far as I could see. Uh, laughter on the outside, sorrow on the inside. Absolutely miserable. And couldn't figure out what life was all about. Didn't seem like it made any sense at all. And I remember going home from a state fair, uh, planning to kill myself, uh, turning on the gas jets in the, in the stove and uh, just breathing until I didn't breathe anymore. And I'm glad I didn't do that. About a year later, I was at a revival meeting I didn't want to go to. In fact, I uh, feigned sickness so I couldn't go, but that didn't work. Had to go. Got embarrassed in Sunday school class trying to answer a question, and I answered the wrong one, and they all laughed at me, and you know, A, I don't want to go, B, I'm made to go, three, I'm, I'm embarrassed in Sunday school, four, I know the way home, and we don't live very far, and so I go down the fire escape after church, and I'm heading for home, and my mom caught me, and uh, we had a discussion about whether I go or not, and uh, a lengthy one, which she won, and by the time we went back in the church, the only place left to sit was the second row from the front. <laughs> Rarified air for me. <laughs> I always sat in the back because that's where you could pass notes. Now people text. But on the second row from the front, I got the full impact of the message. And I realized that God loved me. Jesus died for me. The Holy Spirit was drawing at my heart uh, strings. And I, at the end of that, I, su I surrender. Lord, I give up. I, that's it. I'm done. 
That's it. You win. You died for me. You love me. You gave yourself for me, and you want me as your own. And so I prayed a very simple thing, ask the Lord to save me. That's, that was the beginning. You know, I've said over the years, I'm so grateful for that beginning because all the good things that have happened in my life since then that, that are worth anything, all have happened to me since I trusted Christ as my Savior. Uh, the, the lady I married and the children I've had and the churches we've gone to, including this one, we were here, I think, seven and a half months, and it was wonderful uh, to drive from Greenville to be here to meet with you folks and just, just to see God work in all of our lives together. And if I hadn't been saved in 1958 at that revival meeting, I wouldn't have been able to have been here, and I wouldn't have been able to be the other churches where we've ministered. And that you've got to have a beginning somewhere. You have to receive Christ at a point in time. You don't grow into being a Christian. You're born as a Christian, and then you grow. Where was your place of being born again? Where do you trust Christ as your Savior and really know that you were born again? Uh, for me, it was that revival meeting. And I struggled with my, my assurance. I don't know how many times after I was saved, I prayed this, Lord, if I didn't mean it, I sure mean it right now. And I became, I became a real theologian who directed God uh, in, um, in ways like this. Lord, you said that um, uh, I could be justified through faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and lord that's what i'm doing so i gotta be saved and so i'm saved and uh as pastor mentioned a while ago then the satan satan would say you sin like that you think you're a believer ha and so i'd get shaken up again i'd say lord if i'm not saved i really mean it you know i mean it this time i know i mean it. i double mean it and you know what there came a day one day it occurred to me Jesus Christ promised me that he'd save me if I, tr if I believed on him. He's not a liar, and uh, my life has changed. My, my thinking has changed. My habits have changed. My language has changed. God's changed me. I'm born again. And, I, 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 you know, to that, from that day to this, I've never doubted again that I belong to Jesus Christ as my Savior. Uh, and that salvation is on him. He paid for it. 100%. Where did you trust Jesus Christ? Has there been a, a beginning? You can't uh, have Paul or anybody else say to you, keep on living the Christian life if you haven't started living the Christian life. Now, I know there are a lot of evangelists and maybe pastors who almost seem to try to talk people out of their salvation. And um, they'll use like uh, the book of 1 John and the evidences for being born again, and they'll really bear down on that. And uh, if you don't, if you don't get up, check all the box marks, you know they'll they'll talk you out of salvation. We have people coming forward in some kind of an invitation uh, to get saved who are already born again. And so I wouldn't try to talk you out of your salvation, but I would like to to just urge you today: if you're born again, make sure there's been a time where you realize you offended a holy God with your sin. You offended the holy God of heaven. And that holy God of heaven has to hold you and me accountable for our sin. And there will be consequences for our sin if at the end of your days you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. It isn't churchianity, it's Christianity. It isn't the baptistry, it's being the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleansing your sin. And there has to be some content of understanding if there's going to be a beginning of salvation. There's some things you have to know I'm a, Jesus is the Savior. I'm the sinner he needs to save. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's not just fuzzy feelings and feeling uh, wonderful. Oh, it just feels so wonderful when I go to church. You know, I got the uh, holy jitters when I go to church. Uh, I, I know people who when they got saved, they never shed a tear. They didn't get emotional about it outwardly. But brother and sister, they got saved and their life showed it. And then I know other folks who, boy, they blubbered their way to Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, they broke their heart and sin. And they just, um, I, I, I talked to a fellow one time, and bless his heart, he about three times my size. And uh, he said, Brother Colson. And he fell to his knees. 
and grabbed me around my legs. And he was weeping uh, just uncontrollably because he wanted to find the Lord as his Savior. And uh, we waited about two minutes while he, you know, was just got my shoes all damp crying <laughs> until he finally got up. And, you know, we went to, to my office and uh, he, you know, he was gloriously born again. Uh, and but but we all come to the Lord maybe in different circumstances, but you better have come to the Lord. Are you saved? Are you born again? Jesus said it. You must be born again. Now, here was, here was Timothy. He'd brought up in a Christian home. I believe I, I said this when we were here one time. Just because you were born in an oven doesn't make you a biscuit. <laughs> and just because you were born in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. I had a friend said, you might, I might have been born in a garage, but I wasn't a Cadillac. Uh, and you can be brought up in a Christian surrounding and all the environment and so forth, but until you personally, individually, like Timothy did, place his faith in Jesus Christ, there was, had to be a beginning before there could be a continuance. And I want to re emphasize that. And here's a man who's brought up in a home with a grandmother and a mother who loved the Lord and brought him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And uh, Timothy found the Lord as Savior. I, I believe that when Paul uh, dealt with him, he trusted Christ as his Savior. And, uh, and he learned from his grandmother and his mother because they learned from Scripture. They were Bible believers, and they brought him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Paul's gospel, of course, was the gospel of grace, and a whole lot of folks had to realize, I'm not saved by keeping the law. I'm not saved by keeping any kind of law. Uh, I can't. Isn't it wonderful that the law was given to show us we couldn't keep it and to drive us to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this great gospel of grace, uh, Paul preached and, and Timothy got saved. He was a converted man, truly converted. And uh, then Paul says to him, keep it up. Keep it up. He had... Uh, that example at home. Now, a lot of us did not have that example. I, my dad was unsaved. My mother was saved, uh, had been saved as a child and baptized and grew and loved the Lord, married an unsaved man, uh, and the troubles that go along with that she experienced. Uh, my dad was a good man. In fact, the matter is he was so good, he thought he was better than some of the church people, and in fact, the matter is he probably was outwardly. And um, prayed for him a long time, 21 years, till my dad finally got saved, became a deacon, and uh, went to the pastor who had led me to Christ, and he said, Preacher, I don't know what took me so long to trust Christ as my Savior. I should have been saved a long time ago in helping you, and uh, so the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to do. You can't get rid of me. I'm going to be helping you. Uh, that's what God does when he saves people. So I was brought up in a, uh, in a home with one parent who was a, a believer, and uh, we went to church, made sure that the, my brother John and I went to church. But we had that example. Maybe you didn't have that kind of example. Maybe you had a really rough upbringing. Maybe church wasn't factor in the lives of the people in your family. Uh, but I've said this to people before. If you didn't have that kind of example to follow in your home, then become one. I... You say, well, I couldn't look to a grandmother or a mother like, uh, like Timothy did in my growing up years. But you can be saved, and you can grow, and you can turn your life over the Lord and be an example of the believer that people will look to you for. Um, I read recently uh, in a, a study guide by Betty Henderson about a woman named Lavinia uh, Bartlett, born in eight, early 1800s. And um, they said that early on she was saved and she would come home from the chapel in England where she was uh, going and she'd teach her brothers and sisters about the things that she had been taught. That's a good thing, isn't it? You ever uh, share with somebody what you learned in church or Sunday school? That's a great uh, opening for witnessing, by the way. So she grew in uh, so much that she eventually became a Sunday school teacher at that chapel at age 30, she married, married Mr. Bartlett and uh, uh, became a, a mother of two sons and uh, also was, was a teacher. And they grew up uh, under the loving guidance of their mother, Lavinia, 
and found out about the Lord Jesus. And so they were nurtured in the faith. And this woman continued to grow. She was married uh, to the same man for 17 years. He died suddenly. So she was rearing her sons. And they found out about a, about a fellow in, in uh, England named Charles Spurgeon. You may not have heard of him. Spurgeon was a 20-year-old that had been called to preach at, uh, at a church there in, in England. And the two sons, George and Edward, heard about him, and they wanted to go hear this young preacher. Well, Lavinia, who had taught Sunday school and had classes for years, she wasn't very impre impressed by this young 20-year-old preacher because she had kids that were almost his age. So she didn't want to go. But they kept home, coming home and saying, Man, you, Mom, you've got to hear this guy. You've got to hear this guy. And uh, in fact, both of them were truly converted under the ministry of Charles Spurgeon. So she decides at some point, I'm going to hear this guy, uh, even though he is going to be a passing fad. Well, uh, she never went anywhere else to church after she heard Spurgeon preach. And a deacon came to her, to Lavinia, and he said, you know what? You've taught Sunday school. We've got a need for a Sunday school teacher here in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I wonder if you would be willing to start a class. And she was. Her class at its peak had 800 women in it. it was, she was known all over England as the Mrs. Bartlett's Bible class teacher. 800 women. And can you imagine a frail lady who had heart trouble and lung problems and no microphone to help her teaching 800 women in a Sunday school class? When she died, her pastor had, uh, had written on her tombstone what, what she told her class, keep close to the, clock to the cross, sisters. And uh, Spurgeon said, she was my right hand lady in the ministry here in the tabernacle. That's the kind of influence someone can have in bringing up children in a home where the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified and honored. He, uh, and Betty Henderson called her one of, one of the uh, shadow servants in, in life. You know, there are a lot of folks who are up front. Brother John and I, we get the privilege of being up fronters also bear responsibility well, along with that privilege. But, there, but he and I couldn't do anything in a church much without shadow servants who are behind the scenes, who teach and clean and organize and get the hymn books in the racks and all those kind of things. Nobody may know their name, but they're very, very important. And they're people who have continued doing what God called them to do. You know what you do in, in, as far as in church is important? Yeah, but nobody knows what I do. You know, God knows what you do. I challenged a group of senior adults uh, recently from the verse in Proverbs 20 and verse 12, the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord hath made even both of them. God made our eyesight, gave, gave us hearing, and now I'm helping him with trifocals and hearing aids. And I'm so glad for both of them. And I'm glad for the privilege of being able to see and be able to hear. And yet, you say, well, nobody sees what I do. And really, nobody's heard of me. But there's one in heaven who made the eyes who sees you and, and made the ear who hears your prayers. And he knows about you. And he's saying to you and to me, continue thou in the things you've been learned and the things you've been assured of. Well, you got to start if you're going to continue. And you have to be consecrated to the Lord if you're going to continue, like this woman Lavinia Bartlett was, and like Timothy was, and like Paul was. Do you recall, has there been an event in your life where you really turned your life over to Christ? About, about a year after I was saved, we had a revival meeting. A young man came in. He was from Los Angeles, California. And he was a good-looking Latino fellow. And uh, when he smiled, uh, the whole world lit up. And back then, he had just beautiful, slick back hair and uh, this great personality. And uh, I'd never heard any young man preach like this young man preached. And he preached uh, on committing your, your life to the Lord. And he said, uh, 
How many of you here today could raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you could raise your hand if I ask you to, that you know there's been a time in your Christian life where you said, Lord, I belong to you, hot lock, stock, and barrel, and anything you want me to do from now on the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to do. I, this is the time I'm giving my life to you for what you want it, it done. And so I thought, well, I've only been saved a year, so don't have to think back very far. And I tried to think back very far. Has there been a time where you consciously gave your heart and life for God's service? And there hadn't been a time. At the end of that service, he said, if you'd like for this to be that time, you know the Lord, you're saved, you've been born again, but you never really surrendered your whole life to the Lord for whatever he wants you to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be whatever you want me to be. Let this be that day. And so at the end of the service, he gave an invitation, and I thought, man, that's what I'm going to do. And so uh, we went forward, and he, you know, it was a very short time in the counseling room, and he said, now look, what I'm saying about this total dedication is this. You got a little powder blue convertible, and you love that car, and you put a lot of time and money in it. And God says, I want you to give that up. I want you to drive something else. Or I want you to give it, give it away to somebody else because I want, that's what I want you to do. You belong to me, and I want that car for somebody else. You know what you say? If you're really dedicated to the Lord, I'm giving it away, Lord. I'll walk or ride a bike. doesn't matter to me. Because if you let, say give it up, then I'm going to give it up. I'm yours for whatever you want me to do. And that was about the extent of it. And he said, and, and by the way, uh, if, if you're trying to drive the, the steering wheel of your own life, you know, you, you get out of the way and you let God steer from now on. And don't even help him. He knows how to drive. So you just get over the way and say, Lord, where do you want me to go? You take me. Hey, Maybe you uh, would not have thought it that direction or that way, but has there been a time for you since you've been born again where it's, I'm all yours. Whatever you want me to do. At whatever age you got saved. The rest of my life, I want my life to count for you, period. Uh, you got to have a beginning, but I think in the Christian life, there really has to come a time where you say, I'm your disciple from now on. I want to do whatever you want me to do. And then you, keep, you, you continue by being consistent. Back to our passage of Scripture this morning. Paul said this, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Where did he learn them? He learned them from his grandmother and his mother growing up, from their example and their teaching. Where did he learn the things? From the Apostle Paul and his teaching and doctrine and example. Things you've learned and been assured of. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Your grandmother, your mother, the Apostle Paul, other believers. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And what's, what's the uh, foundation for our walk with the Lord, our consistent walk? All Scriptures given by inspiration of God. We had the privilege of being in, in New Jersey a year and a half, and a fellow came uh, to, to, to go uh, be pastor of the church. And one of the things we were so impressed by him was he came in and he said, uh, God willing, if you'll call me to, to be the pastor here and God leads me to come here, I will do my very best to teach you Bible doctrine so that you know what you believe and why you believe it. And we'll do that in Bible class. We'll do that Sunday morning. We'll do that Sunday night. We'll have a Monday night Bible Institute. We're going to know the word of God that God has given to us so that we can serve him aright. And we said, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And he has done exactly, uh, begun his ministry doing exactly what he said he would do. Because we need doctrine to be consistent and continue. You don't continue on your own cleverness, nor do I. For reproof, what you're doing is not right. You need to change it. For correction, that's the direction you ought to go. And for instruction in righteousness, that's how to keep going. And um, if you have begun with Jesus Christ by being saved, hallelujah, praise God. Welcome to the family. You're a brother or sister in Christ. 
we all look different, think different, dress different. We're all children of a king. Hallelujah, brother. We're going to be in heaven together. Uh, and if you've said to the Lord and to others, I want to serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I want my time on, on earth to count. I don't want to waste my life on me. I want to invest my life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then hallelujah, brother and sister, let's do it. Let's keep it up until Jesus comes. Let's serve and serve and serve and love and love and love and learn and learn and learn until the Lord Jesus comes and, and we hear that call, come up hither, and we go to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Have you wanted to quit, ever wanted to quit? Have you ever quit and had to start back again? Uh, praise God for people who get saved, dedicate themselves to the Lord, and keep living for Jesus. Continue thou. Keep it up. Don't quit. That's too soon to quit. Helen had a pastor, and he said this years ago, and it stuck with me. It's always too soon to quit. Don't quit coming to church. Don't quit reading your Bible. Don't quit praying. Don't quit witnessing. Don't quit giving. Boy, it's obvious that uh, some folks have given in the, in the way the... Uh, uh, the church uh, grounds and the church building here looks today, and my, I commend you for that. Let's don't quit glorifying Jesus Christ as our Savior. He's worthy, isn't he? Uh, I didn't know when I got saved what God was going to do in my life, and you will never be able to tell what God's going to do in your life until you finally give over to him as you should. If that means preparation, further preparation, if that means training, if that means moving, if that means doing anything, uh, whatever he wants, that's what we ought to do. Continue thou in the things that thou hast learned. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for conversion in Jesus Christ. Thank you for beginning your new life in me as a teenager. Thank you for the call of God to preach. I am unworthy. You are all worthy. And I thank you for what you're doing and have done in my life. And I pray for these, my friends, in this, this our congregation this morning. There may be somebody here who's not sure that they know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I pray you'll bring conviction to their heart, joy to their soul, uh, and save the lost if there are any in this building today. There may be a brother or sister who has contemplated giving his or her life to the Lord for whatever he wants to do, but has just never quite come to that place of letting go and saying, God, I want to do what you want me to do. And I just pray, Lord, that that brother or sister may say from the heart, Lord, I know I don't belong to, my, to me. I belong to you. I'm bought with a price, and I want to glorify you with my life. Please lead in, and guide in that, that kind of a decision. And if there's somebody here who's near to quit, who's discouraged, disheartened, and wonders if it's, it's worth it to go on, and I pray you encourage that person today to say this, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And I'm going to serve you, Lord, by your grace and strength until the day you take me home. We love you, Lord. Help us to continue in a way that will praise you and glorify you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Folks, you've been challenged to think about, are you truly born again? Have you come to Jesus? Not do you know a lot about the Bible, not do you go to church, but have you truly trusted in Jesus Christ and him alone, turned from your sin, repented of your sin, and expressed faith and a desire for God to save you, to forgive you, and make you his child? And the promise is, Jesus says, he that comes to me, I will in no way, shape, or form reject or cast out. When he saves us, he keeps us. It's not up to us to get saved. It's not up to us to stay saved. He does the saving when we respond in faith and repentance. And he does, in fact, hold us fast. That's the glorious truth that we're going to end on this morning. He keeps us. God has challenged you, convicted you. 
those, are, those of us that are, are here are available. We'd love to share how Christ can encourage you and how he can keep you and make you his child. Let's stand together and sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. our responsibility to love you, to seek you, to obey you. We can only do those things as we totally cast ourselves in dependence upon you. And we must come to you in saving faith as we've been reminded and challenged this morning. And we have an obligation to trust and to obey. You will never give up on us, Lord, may we not give up on you. May we continue in what you have challenged us with and what you teach us to do and what others by the help of your spirit challenge us to do as well we're grateful for the body of christ we're grateful that you have met with us this morning and we go from here rejoicing in your power and in your goodness and in your provision even as this food that we're about to enjoy together we give you praise for it and all these things god people god's people said amen god bless you hope to see you down there